Why not? <laughs> Good morning. So please make your way to, to the front. Why not? Come to the front. There's lots of room here. We'll start this morning with the award ceremony for Jerome. But before we do that, there's a couple of small announcements I want to make. First of all, for those of you who just registered and this is your first day, please make sure to only look at this program for room locations. If we find you looking for Fisher 5, then uh, we know that you're not looking at this because it doesn't exist, okay? It's in the, only in the book of abstracts. Um, if you are asking us where is Bechtel, we know that you haven't spotted the map on the back of your program, okay? So both of these means that you're getting a lower grade for this conference that you would, you know, would like. A um, couple of other things, session chairs. If you're here, please start your sessions on time. Um, yesterday we had a few sessions that started 10, 15, 20 minutes late uh, and then you're messing things up. Of course, I'm the last one to say something about this because I'm also late this morning. Um, tomorrow morning at 6.30, uh, from here, I will be organizing a campus tour for all those of you who are jet lagged and up at 4 a.m. anyways. Uh, so if you're up early, 6.30, in front of this building, we're going to walk around campus for an hour, and I will show you my favorite sites. Okay, so we'll be back here at 7.30 for coffee and bagels. And so I'll post it also on the board, but if you'd like um, a tour of campus, 6.30 tomorrow. Um, let's see. What else? Oh, yeah. So for those of you, it's going to be very hot today and tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be even hotter than today. If you feel like taking a dip in the pool, we actually have a pool very close by. You can find um, athletic carts for the day, day passes across the road in the fitness center, $7. You have to show your badge. Okay, so this is... Uh, that they know that you're here with the conference, you don't have to be Stanford affiliated, show your badge, you can get a day pass, you can get into every athletic facility. You, you don't even have to show up here anymore, you can spend the whole day going from one facility to the other, okay? We have a climbing wall, we have a, a beach volleyball, um, there's always people playing, you can, you can uh, jump in, basketball courts, uh, soccer outside, uh, swimming pool, you name it, or fitness. If you want to go weightlifting, let me know, I'll take you at 6 on Thursday morning. All right, any questions? Not, then I'll give it to Clint. Good morning, uh, my name is uh, Clint Dawson and I'm here to announce the winners of the SIAG Junior Scientist Prize and the SIAG uh, Senior uh, Career Prize. And let me begin with the Junior Scientist Prize. Um, let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, the SIAG Geosciences awards the SIAG GS Junior Scientist Prize to an outstanding junior researcher in the field of geosciences for distinguished contributions to the field in the three calendar years prior to the year of the award. The recipient's work must be a significant research contribution to geosciences. At least one of the papers containing this work must, must be published in English in a peer-reviewed journal bearing a publication date within the three calendar years prior to the year of the award. Moreover, either the recipient must be a graduate student or the paper's publication date must be no more than three calendar years later than the year in which the author received the PhD or equivalent degree. The award can be received only once in a lifetime. So this year, the selection committee for the award was uh, myself, Yuguang Chen, Jerome Jaffray, uh, Louise Kellogg, and Sue Minkoff. Also, the prize was established in 2008. There are three previous prize winners, so this is the fourth prize winner. So this year, the SIAG Geosciences Junior Scientist Prize is awarded to Tristan von Leuven. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, Tristan couldn't be here with us today, so I accept this award on his behalf, I guess. 
Uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about him. Um, he had a, a family commitment and couldn't be here uh, this week. Since 2014, he's been an assistant professor uh, in the Faculty of Science at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. He received his master's degree in 2006 in computational science from Utrecht. He did his PhD in 2010 in geophysics from Delft University of Technology. He was a postdoctoral fellow from 2010 to 2014 in the Department of Earth and Ocean Sciences at the University of British Columbia. And the citation states for his outstanding contributions to theory, algorithms, and large-scale computing of seismic inverse problems and for his leadership in the field of mathematically informed seismic imaging. So we uh, congratulate Tristan. Next, we have the uh, career prize. Um, the, uh, the SIAG awards the career prize every two years to an outstanding senior researcher, researcher who has made broad and distinguished contributions to the field of geosciences. The award may be given to any scientist who has held a PhD or equivalent degree for at least 15 years, and the award can be received only once in a lifetime. Um, the prize, again, was established in 2008, and so this is the fourth year that we've awarded it. And the career prize in, for 2015 is awarded to Jerome Jaffray. So, Jerome, I have a couple of things to give to you, and then I will, um, I will say a little bit more about you. So this is a little plaque for you to hang in your, you know, your den or whatever. Um, let me get a photograph here. And then we have a much bigger plaque, <laughs> which has the citation on it and everything. This is for your, uh, you know, your office or whatever. Let me just say a little bit about Jerome while he's up here. I've known Jerome, I guess, my whole academic life, pretty much ever since I was a graduate student. And uh, he and Gene used to come and visit us at, at Rice. We used to visit our group at Rice quite often. Um, if you know Jerome, you know he's been at INRIA for many years. He's done seminal work in porous media and the in numerical analysis and applied mathematics in applications related to porous media. Um, my first real impact of, from him was his book with Chavant, Mathematical uh, Theory and Finite Element Methods for Porous Media. It's one of the great books in porous media that really touches on mathematical and numerical aspects of porous media that had not been really touched on before. He's also written many papers and advised many students and been a leader in our field for many years. And <clears throat> just to say a couple more things about him, he's the leader of the esteem. No. Es How do you say that? It was esteem. Esteem. But no. Yeah. 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 Well, this was. He just recently. You're just recently retired, right? No. Anyway. I mean, uh, what? Esteem. He was. Uh, yeah. Okay. Before. Okay. Well. Anyway, he was the leader of the Estima research team in parameter estimation and modeling in heterogeneous media, and the leader of the pump. Tom Duffy yeah. research team in environmental modeling, optimization, and programming models. And the citation says, for outstanding and sustained contributions to the mathematical theory, analysis, and development of numerical methods for partial differential equations with applications to complex flows and porous media, and his leadership in the scientific community. So congratulations, John. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm Carol Woodward. And I have the uh, pleasure of being able to introduce Jerome Jaffrey, and I also have the pleasure of being able to follow Clint's wonderful introduction. Um, I'm not sure if there's a whole lot more to say, uh, except that um, first I want to give another congratulations on the career prize. It's, I think, very befitting that this happened at Stanford uh, with Margot present, who was chair of the activity group when the prize was started. And so we have Margaret to thank for being able to be here and being able to give such honors 
to esteem people in our community. Thank you. Also, uh, see, I, I just wanted to say, um, I also have known Jerome a little while, uh, certainly have felt his impact also through the group at Rice, and I, I give the congratulations there as well. Jerome Jaffrey began his career at INRIA in 1971, where under the direction of Roland Glowinski and Jean-Pierre Yvonne, he received his PhD at the University of Paris VI. In 1976, he joined the research group of Guy Chavant in INRIA and began working on numerical methods for two-phase flow and porous media, mainly a combination of mixed finite element methods and discontinuous finite elements, now called discontinuous Galorgan methods. In 1981 and 82, he was a Dixon instructor at the University of Chicago, working with Jim Douglas, Jr. And in 1986, with Guy Chavant, he published the work, or the book, Mathematical Models and Finite Element Methods for Reservoir Simulation, that Clint referred to. In 91 and 92, he again visited Jim Douglas, Jr. at Purdue University now. And then in 1997, he was head successively of the INRIA Esteem and Pondapi groups that, Jim, uh, that Clint mentioned. And during the years 1995 to 2006, he was a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of ANDRA, the French Agency for the Management of Nuclear Waste. In 2003 through 2007, he was co-editor-in-chief with Mary Wheeler of the journal Computational Geosciences. And his main topics of research have been inverse problems, discretization of nonlinear hyperbolic scalar conservation laws, and more recently, fracture modeling, hexahedral mixed finite element methods, and complementarity formulations, all topics mainly motivated by flow and transport and porous media. So congratulations, Jerome, and we look forward to your, your lecture this morning on uh, reduced, I'm sorry, discrete reduced models for flow and porous media with fractures and barriers. Thank you. <clears throat> So, first thing, I to thank uh, SIAM and the SIAM Geoscience Group uh, for this award. It was uh, certainly unexpected. Uh, like I think I like to say is uh, SIAM and the SIAM Geoscience Group in particular are doing an excellent job at uh, supporting uh, the scientific, scientific community in our field. You know, organizing these uh, wonderful conferences and managing all these journals of very high quality. Uh, I chose this topic. Uh, uh, on fractures, because also I wanted to pay a tribute to my wife and collaborator, Jean Roberts, who uh, was, uh, we spent a lot of time working together with great pleasure. And I, I certainly owe a lot to her. She had a great, great influence on me and on my career. So I am glad to associate her with this award. Now, here you have the list of collaborators that will be worked on the topics I, have, uh, I am going to present you. And uh, we, I will go straight to the right line of my talk. First, there is an introduction uh, to explain uh, the framework of our work. Then uh, there is, uh, I will go through a series of models that I mentioned here, Darcy, double layer reduced fracture model, for Chennai, two phase flow. So let's start. I have to watch my time. So there is a lot of work which is going on on fractures. And so uh, 
It depends on what you want to do, what the goal of your studies. So you have various sorts of models. And so I have to focus, I am going to focus on a certain type of models that we have uh, been working on. A discrete fracture model is a, fra is a model where the fracture is, can be described individu individually, its location and its rock properties. A reduced fraction model is when, uh, instead of looking at uh, the fracture as a subdomain, uh, you reduce it to an n minus one dimensional object, a surface in 3D, a uh, line in 2D. Also, in our model, we want to take into account exchange between the rock matrix and the fracture. There are quite a, few, a lot of work which is done on models where uh, the work where is um, where it is supposed that the matrix rock is impermeable. This, this is not what we do. Um, of course, we're going to have a flow along the fracture. And also, we have a model which allows pressure discontinuities, which is a case when you have a barrier that is a fracture with a lower permeability than in the matrix rock. Finally, uh, well, not quite, there is a, well, we are going to use self-centered numerical schemes. And even after all these restrictions, you still have uh, a choice to do about how, uh, about meshing in, uh, for your problem. So you have uh, two possibilities. One, on the first option on the left is the fractures are aligned with cell boundaries. This is what we do. And, but there is also the other option that other people are working on where the fractures cut through the cells and they use uh, uh, ideas coming from uh, the extended finite element method. This is a short bibliography. Of course, I cannot, I could, I cannot, uh, re uh, it's not complete. Well, it's, there is a lot of interesting thing, papers which are, which, are, is not, which are not listed here. Uh, we had yesterday, for instance, a lecture by Stephen Geiger, and there are many symposia on fractures. So, but this is a way to, this is maybe the papers we, we have used the most. Now, let's start quickly with the simple model. Darcy's law. The uh, standard uh, formula for uh, incompressible uh, Darcy law, flow. We have a domain which is divided into three subdomains here. Omega f is the domain uh, of the fracture. Omega 1 and omega 2 are the domains for the matrix rock. The notations uh, are evident, are obvious. And of course, in, the, in such a setting, we have a transmission condition at the interfaces between the subdomains, which says that the pressure is continuous as well as the normal component of the flux. So the basic idea is now we want to replace omega f as a subdomain by a fracture, by an interface gamma here on the picture, it's a line, it's now a line. So the equation will be the same in the subdomains, but now we have to write interface condition on gamma. And of course, these interface conditions have to be non-local because there is flow along gamma. Wait, I have a problem. What's going on here? No. I'm sorry, neither. I have a problem. My PDF file is not 
Uh, like it should be. Let me do it again. It's fine now. Oh, yeah, I have to go to the full screen mode. I'm sorry about this. So <clears throat> how we do go to this interface uh, model? We are going to shrink uh, the subdomain omega f into an uh, interface hyperplane, gamma. Then uh, uh, we introduce the normal uh, tangential and normal components of the permeability and the velocity. Then we are going to uh, the fracture, still has a width d. It's not, the interface does not have a thickness, but the fracture keeps its uh, thickness d. So uh, across the fracture, we average the conservation equation and the Darcy, and Darcy's law. We introduce the new unknowns are now U gamma, which is the, here we have U gamma as an integral of the tangential component across the fracture. Q gamma as a source term also the same way, integral over across the fracture. And P gamma is the average pressure in the fracture. And then here are the equations we have obtained. For U gamma, conservation equation, but then there are some extra terms here coming from the contribution of the subdomains to the flow in the fracture. This represents the flow in the fracture. And here we have the Darcy's law, things which has changed here with, we have the width of the fracture which appears here for uh, an effective uh, permeability. Now, we've, when we've done that, we need also uh, trans uh, trans transmission condition across uh, uh, the fracture. And these are obtained by integrating the normal component of the Darcy's law. So this is what we can uh, we obtain. Xa is a parameter for uh, integration, but what we can we always set it to one. So if xa, xa is equal to one, xa bar is equal to zero, you see you have a, a Darcy's law across the fracture. Here you have the difference between the pressure in the, uh, in the boundary of the sad domain and the pressure in the fracture. There, here we obtain the, in, this is uh, just a uh, recollection of what we've done. Here the equation in the subdomains, the equation in, uh, on gamma, okay, this is, represents the flow in the fracture here, and here are the interface conditions. We notice that if k is large, then you divide by k, or you can make it tend to infinity, and you see you obtain pi equal to pi gamma. That's why in most, in a lot of work, people assume continuity of the pressure when the fracture has a very large permeability. But what we are doing here, we are going to look at both, uh, both cases in the, the case of a high permeability fracture and the case of a barrier. Analysis model, bon, something we've done a long time ago. We use the mix, the mix method, mix formulation, and apply the theory which goes with it, and in 
we were able to show existence of uniqueness of the solution. And these are in these two old papers. Now, there is a question of intersecting fractures. What do we do? Now, it's not uh, on, on this, on the picture here. These fractures is actually divided in two fractures from the intersection point to the end on both sides. Uh, this is for uh, practical uh, purposes. Even if this may be just one fracture. Uh, the condition that you have to put at the interface is straightforward in the case of high permeability fractures. It's just continuity of the pressure and, of course, continuity of the flux. Of course, when you, have, uh, you can have a more complicated situation, you can have a fracture and a barrier. I'll show some examples. Oh, and uh, it's not so simple what you do at the intersection point. You have to decide, uh, make some uh, phys physical assumptions to decide what you are going to do, which, which uh, to obtain the condition at the intersection point. So one important uh, thing you want to do is to use non-matching grid also. The grid uh, in the fracture may differ, be different from what it is the grid in, in the matrix rock. But we use mixed finite element spaces. There is one space for uh, each subdomain. And here, image gamma is the space for the fracture. So if these are three-dimensional spa spaces, this one is only a two-dimensional space. Same thing, so the pressure are piecewise constant. And for the, uh, uh, for the velocity, we use uh, the Ravier-Thoma and Nedelec spaces in 3D here, and the last one in 2D. To show give you an example, here we have an example, uh, three fractures here intersecting. So actually, it, it's it's uh, implemented as five fractures: one here, one, two, three, four, and five, with various permeability in the subdomains and in the fracture. Uh, in this case, there will, be, there will be no barrier. So we have a pressure drop from one side to the other. The flow is uh, zero through these boundaries, and there is also a pressure drop from here to here, equal to, to, to this one here. So when we do uh, the picture, so first the mesh, so we see we have completely the mesh are not matching. And you don't see, of course, the mesh on the, in the fractures, on the fractures, because uh, we cannot represent it, but it's there. they don't, do not match at all neither of these uh, meshes. And there are various, well, this is a description of the, of the meshes. And when you calculate, Still, you obtain a very nice, smooth, uh, pre continuous pressure. And uh, we have uh, here the velocity field, which is fairly complicated when you look at it. I don't know if I can show you. This is a blow up. So here you have the fractures. Here. And you see my, nothing is matched, but the continuous is really nice. So and this is for the velocity here. So you see we have, you, are, you have a very complex flow because of all the differences in the permeabilities. 
and but it's, it's uh, everything works very well. So we were able to show distance and uniqueness of the solution for the discrete problem. We had optimal error, optimal order error optimates, and uh, the proof was done in the case of matching matching grids in this paper, and with, uh, for non-matching grids in this other paper. So the very interesting point here is it's not like when you are just dealing with uh, domain decomposition uh, of a standard elliptic problem, and uh, you need to use mortar to get uh, non-matching grids here. The, uh, the fracture itself plays the role of the mortars. So we don't have any restriction on the grid for the fractures. And we don't have, and we can use piecewise constant pre pressure uh, on gamma. This, these things which generally are not possible in the standard problem. This makes now, I'm going to show you a few examples. Again, uh, this is a problem. Now, you have a pressure drop from here to here. It's closed here, here, and here. And we have a pressure drop in this direction. And we see what you obtain here with uh, non-matching grids. And here, we have a finer uh, grid in the fracture which is what you would do uh, uh, naturally if uh, you have a high permeable, a high permeable, a high permeable fracture. So this here is a fine mesh here for in the fracture. Now, if instead I put a coarser, a coarser grid, which is not the natural thing to do, Precise. Now, uh, we, what you can see, there are a, a few little things happening here uh, along, along the fracture. But this is, these are not instabilities. This go, goes away uh, when uh, you refine the mesh. Here you have you know, a very coarse mesh, actually, uh, on the fracture compared to what you have in the subdomains. Now, we go to the case of a barrier. Alors in the case of a barrier, here I, have a, I put a fine grid on the barrier, which, which is not the natural thing to do, but still we wanted to see what happens. And what we see is it's the pressure is fine, except in the, in the fracture, there is this kind of uh, oscillations, which are not very important in practice because nothing is going on actually in the fracture because it's a barrier. But these oscillations, they go away when you refine the mesh like we have done here. They are smaller and even smaller. There you don't, they disappear. So this convergence is still there even in the case uh, in this unnatural way of gridding. And the last, but the, last the, the thing to do is actually to use, when you have a barrier, is to use a coarser uh, grid in the fracture. And here you can see the solution is perfect, even with a very coarse mesh along the fracture. So this is all what I want to say about uh, Darcy flow. Uh, no, I mean uh, the simplest model. Now I'm going to go to some more recent work. Uh, it's, we, uh, it's called the double layer reduced fracture model. So this is work which is done with uh, French Institute of Petroleum, and it can get 
this uh, in this paper with a colleague, Isabel Fay, from, uh, from uh, uh, Alessio from Magali from uh, IFP. Well, Alessio, Alessio is not anymore there. He's back in Italy. Now, uh, the situation is the following. If this is a work for, there is a problem. Here, this is a fault. There is a, something went wrong here. So I wanted, this is a work for the simulation of semi, uh, the history of semi-sedimentary basin. And, uh, and this is a way to handle sleeping faults. So you have a domain here. You have your fracture in the middle, omega-1 and omega-2. And omega-1 are, 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 omega are sleeping along the fault. And so what they did before was to introduce a formulation, uh, formulation where to, you had not only one flow along the interface, but two flows, you know, like uh, following the, the, dot, uh, the dotted line on both sides of the middle of the fold. So we apply the same uh, uh, technique as before, but what we, we applied it from uh, this inter interface here to the center of the fracture, and then from the middle of the fracture to uh, the interface of the domain. And we, and we, um, and then you need, so you need transmission condition across here, across here, and then from one flow in o omega F1 and to the other flow, omega F2. So the equations are pretty much the same. We have, so Darcy is low, in omega one, that is low in omega two. We have here the equation in along the two lines, okay. Uh, it's it is the same, except now you have uh, as a source term a contribution of what's coming from the other side of uh, the fracture and from the subdomain. Okay, so you have two contributions. So UN, U hat N is actually the flow going from one side to the other side. And here you have the Darcy's law as before. The coupling conditions are similar. We have a Darcy's law here coupling the two sides. So now, this one is for, no, this one is coming out of the subdomain, U, A, N. It has a difference between what's going on on the subdomain and uh, this, uh, the dotted line. We have another one. This is coming from exchanging between the two sides. And here, what comes is a difference between the pressure on the two dotted lines. Here are the expression of the permeabilities, the effective permeabilities. And here, in particular, for this one, we use uh, harmonic averaging to go from one side to the other. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Here, this, uh, this calculation has been done at IFP. You have a domain with many layers. And the picture on below is, represents the fault. And the fault, and here you see the fault on one side of the fault with uh, several layers too, and the fault uh, uh, and the other side of the fault here. So they don't match, but so that's why we have to show both. 
So nothing match because this actually does not match either. No. The subdomain is two. So this is um, so our work was an extension of previous work on simply faults, which was done at IFP, and. Uh, uh, it used the e hybrid exhydral self-centered finite volume method, uh, which you can find in this paper. Uh, of course, uh, all this was, was um, uh, discretized with uh, exhydra. And... Uh, uh, you, had, uh, you need a robust uh, self-centered finite volume method to obtain correct results in this kind of situation. Now, this is what we can see, what we have here, you see, because you see the fault is also inclined. So what we see here is a velocity field now we, we, where we have a pressure drop from the bottom to the top. And in this first case, the subdomains are homogeneous, so all the layers have the same properties. And the same thing for the fractures, and even more, the fractures have the same properties as uh, the subdomains. So, of course, this is just simulating in a, uh, uh, in a cube, uh, a homogeneous cube. And you can see on the picture the velocities in gray, the arrows are those near the faults, and in green, they are uh, away from the fault, the arrows. So what we can see here is that all the arrows are per perfectly uh, vertical. So we chose that uh, the numerical method is doing a good job at handling uh, these exhydral meshes. Now, the other example is when you have a barrier here, it works fine also, because uh, we can see that uh, the gray arrows remain inside uh, the barrier and they don't go into the subdomain, so it's a good barrier. On the other hand, when in the case of the channel, we can see the exchange between the channel and the subdomains. So this was uh, the case with the same, uh, um, all layers with the same properties, but now the actual problem is, uh, is this, these are the results. So this is a case first, when we put the same properties in the fracture, and that in, in the subdomains. Uh, bon, and now the situation gets more, more complicated because we have all these layers with different permeabilities, some barriers, and so the electricity field is complicated. When it is a barrier also, uh, we can see it's more complicated the velocity field, but in the, in the barrier, everything remains in the barrier. The gray arrows are still remaining in the barrier. Like here, and like here, when you have the channels, we can see the exchange between the channel and uh, the subdomains. Now, this is all for this examples. Now, just a quick word about Forshire-Hammer flow. There is, a, so this was a problem, the idea was when you have a, a fracture with a high permeability, one idea would be to use Forshire-Hammer flow in the fracture. You still keep Darcy's law in uh, omega one and omega two in the rock matrix, but you put uh, for shimmer flow in the fracture. So this is what you have here. In the fracture, you can see the uh, equation, which is which has changed a little, uh, for shimmer flow in the, in the fracture. 
But the cross the fracture, it's still Darcy. Of course, you are not going to put for Schirmer flow across the fracture. We were able to, from my colleagues were able to do, to work out analysis uh, numer uh, uh, show to calculate with this first, and there is some uh, mathematical analysis that Jean did with uh, Peter Knabner. Now I go to two-phase flow. Um, We use there the global pressure formulation. So the situation with the global uh, two-phase flow is much more complicated because of all the nonlinearities. So we use the global pressure formulation. So you have the saturation equation here for the wetting phase. So uh, UW, the Darcy velocity for the wetting phase is a sum of two terms. One represents capillarity diffusion. And the other one is an advection term where uh, you have one part which is due to the general flow, ut. ut is the total Darcy velocity, the sum of the Darcy velocity of the phase, for the phases, and there is here uh, a gravity term. So this is the pressure saturation equation, and now we have the pressure equation. This is an incompressible case. So here uh, we have uh, divergent of UT equal to zero. We have uh, uh, Darcy, uh, Darcy law here, which can be written in, which is written in terms of the global pressure. And here we have the expression of the global pressure, which is not a physical quantity, but it, which is a ma mathematical tool. Everywhere you have function, alpha, beta, bt, bj, uh, bt, uh, rho, all these functions depend on capillary, enfin, only, alpha depends only on capillary pressure and mobilities, while all the others depend on the mobilities. Now, Before going to the fracture case, it's better to look d'abord what happened at the condition between rock types. Suppose now your subdomain has two rock types. So the porosity, the permeability is changing, and also the relative permeability and the capillary pressure is changing from one side to the other. Uh, what are the conditions so we're going to put across sigma, the interface here? So the easy part is for the conservation, conservation because you have a conservation of phases for both, of each phases, of each phase. And of course, then you have, of course, conservation of the total phase, tot, uh, total Darcy velocity. And now also we have the continuity of phase pressures. So what does it imply? for us. So here I draw two pictures. This is a model where you have the two capillary pressure have the same endpoint, kind of a von Genuchten model, while on the other side here, this is a Brooks and Corey model where you have different capillary pressure at the end point. I'm not going to talk about this one. It's a bit more complicated, but it can be done the same in a similar way. So let's consider this case. So since you have a continuity of the phase pressure, that means you have continuity of the capillary pressure. That's what I wrote here. And since the, the curves here are different, then you have different saturation on both sides. So you have discontinuous saturation at the interface. Uh, this is for the saturation equation. For the pressure equation, you still you have also the fact that the pressure, global pressure here is a sum of the average phase pressures plus a function of the saturation. This then uh, this function is going to change from one side to the other. This is a continuous part. So what happens is P minus beta 
is what is conserved at the interface. This is what I've written here. So we have actually also a discontinuity in the global pressure at the interface. Now, for, to go to the fracture case, now we want to shrink the interface, uh, the fracture into an interface. So you have, now we have three uh, rock types, one on this side, one on the fracture, and one on the other side. So what do we have? We still have the same equation in the subdomains. These have not changed. But equation in gamma, working out as we've done before, you have an equation in gamma, which represents the flow in the fracture, with a source term here. This is actually the jump in the, the difference in the flow coming out on, uh, of the subdomains. It's UW1 N1 plus UW2 N2. So the, um, besides that, the equation is similar, except we have changed the unknowns are now S gamma and UW gamma. This is for the saturation equation. And same thing for the pressure. You need here a source term for uh, con the contribution of the source of the subdomains to uh, the global flow. To the okay. So now that uh, more, uh, we have to look at the transmission condition across gamma, when you work out your problem uh, as before, you have, for the saturation equation, you have a Darcy's law here for the waiting phase, where you see here the difference between the pressure on the boundary of the domain and the pressure in the, in the fracture gamma, the pressure on the interface. Makes sense. And you have something similar for the uh, pressure equation for UT, total Darcy velocity, is written as the difference between the pre uh, average pressure on the boundary of the subdomain and the values on uh, gamma. This is just another way of rewriting the same thing, but in terms of the main uh, unknowns. How do we, did we do work out the problem? We use uh, we, you, we are used to, use, to split diffusion and advection. Uh, we, are going, we worked out the problem in 3D. I'm going to show you uh, a few results. Uh, so for the second order term, so the diffusion term of the equation, we use big finite element, 3D tetrahedral mixed finite element, why tetrahedrons? Because we are going to go with very complex geometry. How much time? Five minutes. It's really enough. And um, on the fracture, uh, on the interface gamma, I should have written uh, gamma instead. We have a 2D, two-dimensional triangular self-centered finite volume. For, uh, uh, since we are using uh, diffusion and advection, that's because we want to use uh, something different for advection. We have implicit LR for diffusion, explicit LR for advection, where we use self-centered finite volume and mobility of winding, but you could use also the Godunov method. Um, so we have different types we would like, we have different time steps for diffusion and advection. 
We would have liked to have different time steps for fracture and the rock matrix, but this is not done yet. There is a paper that was written by Huang, Jaff, Caroline Jaffe, Kep, Michel Kern, and Lynn Roberts about space time domain decomposition to you using space time domain decomposition for that, but it's not, it's not, it has not been applied for the show, for the pictures I am going to show. Uh, I have to acknowledge the help of the Inria Gamma Free Group because there is obviously now big problems about meshing. Um, they are, so how it is done for the moment, we have, uh, we, they use this program which is called BEL Surf which are, is going first to discretize the, two, the interface, the two, it's a two-dimension, two-dimensional uh, null interface, uh, and of course the boundary. So you have a, a, a mesh on the boundary and on the fracture, and from there you use the other software, GHS 3D, for vol volumetric meshing. And this is a drawback of both of the method that if you don't are not you are not uh, a very if uh, sophisticated uh, 3D uh, meshing is not allowed for is not this available for you you have uh, trouble uh, to do these things. Also, we want to acknowledge that we use. The, the thing is written in MATLAB, okay? And we use parts of the Sintef library MRST, and all the results can, are shown in, in the thesis, PhD thesis of Elias Ahmed and in your paper, which is almost finished. Now, it's blocked again, huh? I don't understand. Okay. I don't know. Here is the first experiment. Experiment. You have here a sort of a cube, a rectangular cube. And uh, we have, uh, we're going to look at flow going from the purple side to the blue side. And then here we have a fracture. These are the values. Uh, for the moment, the fracture uh, will go, uh, we have um, higher permeability than in the matrix. An important point I have to say, because we are going to see the effect it has on the pictures, is the fracture does not go all the way to the inflow and boundary boundary. It stops a little bit here, and at the end, the perme on gamma, the, perme the, fracture, the rock matrix is the same as in the subdomain. Okay? So the fracture stops actually away from the end from the, from the end. We use the same relative permeabilities everywhere, and so, but the capillary pressure are, are changing because we use this formula where here you have K. So it's a function which is a function of S times this constant, and I, since I'm changing K, I'm changing the capillary pressure. So here are the pictures that we can obtain. Uh, this is one example. You have the, uh, you see what happens. It's spreading uh, at the end here. Also, I have to say that the saturation in the fracture are not shown on the picture. It's only the subdomain. 
But what you can see, there is a spreading of the uh, injecting on the satura saturation of the injected fluid because um, uh, because uh, uh, as I mentioned before, the fracture does not go all the way to the end uh, of the domain, to the boundary. So we have two different times. Alors, this is a picture from the bottom, and then we see the effect of gravity because what we uh, there is there much uh, there is more the injected fluid is going down uh, more in, at the bottom than at the top. Uh, bon, maybe I should go quickly. This was an exa another example here with three fractures. And which one, with one which is more permeable. And anyway, we can see here what happens. And uh, one example with a barrier. We have a barrier here. And we see that uh, nothing goes through the barrier. And this is the kind of thing what you can obtain, the kind of result you can obtain. This is my last slide, okay? There is still a lot of things to do, it's clear. We want to use, uh, uh, well, we what could be done is the extension to other fracture models, even in geomechanics, actually. Uh, as I mentioned before, we like to use uh, non-matching grids in, in time as well as in space. It's, this is not done here for the moment. We'd like to develop a, a posterior error estimates. And because we want to like to go to the, this challenge of simulating in a domain like that, which still are going to require a lot of work. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.